Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth day of Symposium as you go, roads under your feet towards the new future. I'm here to introduce today's moderator of the panel, Sinknech Asetu. I have a lot to say about Sinknech. He's an inspiring voice within contemporary literature in Ethiopia and he's terrible with replying emails. He has done amazing research within our project and continues to be inspiration even when you hear a very short piece of writing by him. And today you will hear his introduction to the panel. Simken Asatu's pen name is Otan Pulto. He's published author and landscape architect. He develops his novels and children's stories based on his studies and in interpretation of cultural landscape to help preserve indigenous cultures and natural ecosystems. He develops positive youth development and empowerment media products for children and youth. Among nine of his published works, fiction and non-fiction are Catch Your Thunder, Rendezvous with the End, A Thousand Versions of Love, The Tao of the Dusty Food Philosopher, Affordable Base Conceptual Framework for Landscape Architecture, Dealing with Change in Fixity and Fixity in Change. In the, he's at the moment in the process of publishing 12 children books, a fruity, a fruity City series, Apple My Friend, based on Fruity City children world that he has created. It is an imaginary world where children are leaders. I think it's good to imagine that today. He's a founder of Startup, a social entrepreneurship company called Fruity City Children World, which he currently manages. Thank you very much, Sinknet, for hosting today's session, and welcome. There is a book by one of my favorite poets, Hafiz, entitled The Subject Tonight is Love. For our audience from around the world, I say the subject today is sea. I am Sinkna, or Otam Pulto, a poet, author, and landscape architect from Ethiopia streaming from my home in Addis Ababa. I have always been struggling to have the balance of my life tilt more to my artistic interests than my academic activities. But often the academy wins. For example, I participate in the As You Go project in the academy than in the art. My involvement in this research-based art project is telling me that the boundaries between art and science are fuzzy and I should redirect my struggle toward the synthesis. Today's speakers will also show us how the boundaries between art and science are practically negotiated in their collective researches. Being from a landlocked country, I do not have a personal experience with sea, ports, and seafaring. However, these are romantic subjects in my readings. I feel there always is something enigmatic and inspiring about seas and ports that need to be explored more, however much they may have been explored in the past. I guess. Many of our audiences have more practical experience about today's subject than me. Even if they don't, the, issue, the issues our speakers will deal with cut across disciplines and cultures, such as representation, knowledge and culture production, the local, the national, and the global, the subjective and collective identities, expressions and connectivities across spatial and temporal boundaries at the face of the Chinese-led globalization and of course of COVID-19. I'm confident that we will have a lively discussion. Our first speaker is Nikita Inchentai. Nikita lives and works in Guangzhou, China, where she is currently Associate Director and Chief Creator at Guangzhou 
Times Museum. She has curated a number of exhibitions such as, you can only think about something if you think of something else. Interesting, right? In 2014. Roman Ondak Storyboard in 2015. And Big Ten Elephants, one hour, no room, five shows in 2016. She is also organizing a paracuratorial series at Guangzhou Times Museum, which features an annual discurs discursive platform. Nikita will talk about how the historical concept of the ancient Maritime Silk Road is represented in four state run museums in China for the consumption of informed middle class urban needs to perform an up-to-date globalization supported by the state and guarded by national ideology. With this, I will leave the platform for Nikita. Thank you for the introduction. My presentation today is titled A Manifold of Global Connectivity and the Performativity of Guarded Globalization. Time Seal Row in China's Port City Museums. My presentation today is based on a research trip titled Paracuratorial on the Move, the Freeding Union of Portals. We invited folk scholars, independent researchers, curators, and artists to join us for a 12-day trip to take walks in four major port cities in, on the east coast of China, including Ningbo, Fuzhou, Quanzhou, and Xiamen. These port cities were all important gateways of imperial goods and colonial goods, and they are still sites of worldly encounters where we can observe the manifold of verbal processes and connectivities. I will unpack my few notes by presenting how my personal experiences of living in Guangzhou and my working as chief curator at Guangdong Times Museum have guided me through a variety of contradictory understandings of globalization. At the end of the presentation, examples of three state-run museums are taken to examine how the historical term of Silk Row and Maritime Silk Row, originally coined by German geographer and sinologist, are enacted and visualized by state-run museums in China to perform a globalization guarded by the state as reaction, reactionary strategy to the shifting state ideology and global media environment. Between 1868 and 1872, German geographer Ferdinand von Christophen took several, seven expeditions <clears throat> to describe to the outside world the vast deposits of coal in China's Northwest interior. And the use of the term silk row uh, used to describe the yellowish silk-like material covering much of North China. Celebrated in the West as a pioneer of scientific exploration in China and verified in China for opening the floodgates of imperialism, his legacy remains contested until today. Suling Louise presents in her book, Cities in Motion, that cosmopolitanism is not an abstract philosophical concept, but a way of living for people who reside in poor cities. In 2007, German sinologist Hoderek Pedak under, undertakes a historical survey of the seas between East Africa and Japan, spanning from the early beginnings of seafaring through to the modern era in his book, The Maritime Sea Road. And in 2013, Chinese President Xi Jinping first officially announced China's and Central Asia countries' plan to construct an economic bow along the Silk Road at Kazakhstan and claim a trans-Eurasian project spanning from the Pacific Ocean to the Baltic Sea. And one striking phenomenon of the pandemic is the coexistence of this information and the access of it, information and we are torn apart by stream of local urgencies and media ties global events. 
It seems that the cosmopolitan rhetoric and intellectual languages of contemporary art have fallen behind in registering the factual realities and the polarized sensitivities. When geopolitical topics and impulse of survival widen the divide between we and they. So does it still make sense to connect the local with the global? Why may the history of port cities and regions, especially those embedded within the southern constellations and processes, offer different imaginations of globalization. I was born in Guangzhou and have spent most of my life living and working here. It has always been a trade city and a city of traffic, be it for people or goods. It was marked by the Canton system developed from the 17th to 19th century, which regulated trading between Imperial China and foreign merchants, especially the British. The Canton system emerged partly because the port of Guangzhou was already a vibrant southern port as early as the 10th century, when silk, tea, ceramics, and other handcrafted articles from China and spices and dry goods from Southeast Asia and the Indian Peninsula were sorted and traded. <clears throat> One such example is the Manila saw. During the Ming Dynasty, the mulberry and sericulture industry of Canton was robust, and the silk was weaved into the source by local embroidery artisans. European floral patterns such as roses and carnations were adapted to appeal to an international audience. Spanish and Latin American women became enamored with the intricate design. This was a time when Spain dominated the maritime trade routes when a range of colonial luxuries got loaded in Canton and transported via Manila, Mexico, before arriving in the southern port of Sevilla, the same route taken by the explorer Magellan. Although it was soon lost its imperial advantages to the monopoly of British East Indian Company. This native trade route, which connected the South China Sea with the Indian Ocean prior to the region's integration into the global hierarchy of imperialism, is what the German sinologist Hutterich Padak called the Asian Maritime Sea Road, dated from 9th to 14th century. One important aspect of the Asian Maritime Sea Road was its bottom up autonomy of navigation. It was a worldly practice by indigenous traders before the emergence of sovereignty over territorial waters and it makes subaltern exchange of peoples, cultures, and materials possible. This signage, the signage of the Treaty of Nanjing in 1842 can be considered a different apple of Guangzhou's integration into the global trade system. Together with four other ports, including Xiamen, Ningbo, Fuzhou, and Shanghai. Guangzhou became a treaty port where the notorious trades of opium and coolie laborers took over the importance of other trading goods and the long existing native trade of routes. After the British Empire abolished the transatlantic African trade, African slave trade in the 19, early 19th century, cheap labor from China and India was sought after to further promote free trade in the global market. The early form of transnational trafficking connects Fujian and Guangdong, the main export gates of coolies, with Kakauta, where opium was planted, harvested, and merchandised. These Asian laborers collected guano in Chile, work with poor conditions um, to tunnel the Panama Canal, and were confined in the sugarcane plantations of British Caribbeans. The cultivation and consumption of opium certainly led to the poverty of the laborers and their exploitation, but the production and circulation of the dehumanized bodies and addictive plants also reflected the peril realities of different geographies. From a very brief glimpse of Guangzhou's port history, it is clear that we are embedded within the rich network of the global selves. Yet global processes and connectivities among southern cultures and regions remain tenuous and underrepresented. If we are to reclaim intimacies among distant people, places, and culture, and to shall I on our entangled existence, 
we should propose other forms of knowledge sharing that may help to bridge this difference and de deconstruct the categorization of imperial archives and national history. Now I'm going to zoom in even closer to the short institutional trajectory of Times Museum, contextualized by Ram Kuhas urban studies of the region and the anthropological term of low-end globalization proposed by Gordon Matthews in the early 2000s. Greatly Forward is a 700 pages publication edited by Ram Kuhas, and it was an outcome of an urban study field trip in 1996. It constructs an eclectic glossary filtered by the gaze of a group of students from the Harvard Design School. Terms such as city of exacerbated difference defines the chaotic, competitive urban landscape of the Pearl River Delta in stark contrast with the European city ideal of balance and harmony. While the ironic renewal of the historical term greatly forward depicts the region as the conversion of rice paddies and villages into postmodern villas and office towers. The Pearl River Delta was in fact a geo-economic economical construct promoted by the market economic reform pioneered by Deng Xiaoping in his South, Southern China tour in 1992. It is consequently subjected to top-down reformation and reconstruction. In 2017, cities of the Pearl River Delta were regrouped and renamed as Canton, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. The PRD identification based on the indigenous Cantonese culture was displaced by the geopolitics, geopolit economic interests connecting the region with South China Sea and the Pacific Rim. After 20 years of reform and opening policy, the emergence of multicultural world become more, more perceivable on the local level and people of different colors, cultures, and religions became part of the city's urban texture. Now Guangzhou is not only the southern port of Maritime Silk Road, but also a trading center for fast-moving merchandises such as clothing and electronic products connecting Guangzhou with Africa. It was against such an, a backdrop that anthropologist Scott and Matthew observed a dichotomy structure of globalization what he calls the low-end globalization versus the high-end globalization. And it soon permeates permanent po popular imagination about Guangzhou being an enclave of government regulations. Matthew defines low-end globalization as the transnational flow of people and goods involving relatively small amounts of capital and informal, sometimes semi-legal or illegal transaction, often associated with the developing world, but in fact, apparent across the globe. Matthew's, points, uh, Matthew's uh, observation points out the intersectional aspect of globalization that is charged by gender, class, and race. But at the same time, he reaffirmed the global hierarchy of high and low, developed and developing, center and periphery. So instead of advocating for another structure of dichotomy, I'm arguing for the artistic interrogation as emergent form of knowledge that testifies to the speculative, anachronistic, and contingent aspect of global encounters across difference. As Anna Singh stated in her book, Friction, it has become increasingly clear that all human cultures are shaped and transformed in long histories of region to global networks of power, trade, and meaning. She further explains that cultures are continu continually co-produced in the interactions I call friction. The awkward, unequal, unstable, and creative qualities of interconnection across difference and code. On the contrary to the top-down state construct, Times Museum is a contingent product of cultural encounter, which conceptually extended Rampruha's ideal of going forward harnessed by the international curatorial framework of the second Guangzhou Triennial, proposed by Ho Han Ru and Hans Ulrich Albers in 2005, and negotiated materialized challenge by local agencies. It registered the situated effort of cultural makers to transform an architectural ideal into something that makes sense to the local people. After 10 years of curatorial practice at Times Museum, I become more aware that as an institution that is co-produced by cultural fiction, 
we cannot shut away from the social and cultural conditions in which we continue to rely on and reflect on. That's why we decided to embark on the trip of Paracuritoro on the move last year to take a closer look at what might be called the mainstream globalization represented by state-run museums in China. <clears throat> there have long been debates over the consequences of globalization. In the first 20 years after the end of the Cold War, there was a balance and a tactic understanding between the developed and emerging economies and the globalization of this period was considered unguarded. However, the global finance, financial crisis in 2008 revealed to the emerging economies that there were problems with the US dominated economic system. China's Belt and Road Initiative and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank have to a certain extent served to counter the concern. So some economies claim that globalization has moved into a different phase in which countries will start building walls again to reduce their risk and vulnerabilities in globalization. This image of guarded globalization became more prominent during the presidency of Trump and state-run museums in China have picked up the guarded tone along the outbreak of COVID-19 and the recurring rhetoric of a new Cold War. I'm interested in the state-run museum's inherent disruption, what I see as an awkward, unequal, and unstable display com complex. These three museums I take for examples, including the Ningbo Bang Museum, Quanzhou Maritime Museum, and Xiamen Overseas Chinese Museum, seem to be driven by a paradoxical understanding of globalization. On one hand, they serve as important vehicle to legitimize the political authority and coherence of socialist legacy, in which feudalism of imperial China and the imperial and colonial suppression from Western powers have been defended by long lines of patriotism and the revolutionary Chinese Communist Party. On the other hand, the heightened cultural nationalism sits in contradiction to the need to promote the contemporary image of China, which is proactively embracing market economy, free trade, multilateralism, and globalization. In museums and nationalism in contemporary art, Edward Wickers looks at the shift of state ideology from socialism to patriotism since the early 1990s. Museum narrative and displays in China continue to change over time as a result of shifting ideologies and demands. They are communicating to an emerging urban public that is more educated and informed about the world. While an heterogeneous, polarized, and even conflictual world will is constantly fed to individuals through the internet. It is inevitable that the homogeneous and totalizing vision of China's past and Chinese identity got counteracted. While Victor affirms the state-run museum's designated role for patriotic education that can be viewed as extracurricular extension of the patriotic education delivered through history lessons in school, I'm proposing a form of curatorial and artistic agency that scrutinizes what the state-run museums choose to emphasize, misinterpret, or omit, and highlight the struggle between the open and the garden, the past and the future, the local, the national, and the global. Ningbo Bang Museum is founded in 2009, and the word, and the word Bang is, in Chinese, implies a sense of blood bounded clan ethic, which regulated the Chinese society for a long time. When we entered the Ningbo Bang Museum, we were welcomed by a slogan, mobilize the Ningbo Bang in the world for the modernization drive of Ningbo, signed by the name of Deng Xiaoping. The developmentalist optimism is striking, but the transnational mobilization of the local and its direct bridging with the global seems to be more curious. I cannot stop but wondering where is the national situated in such morale? Walking through the well-funded space and permanent hands, the museum offers a stark overview of transnational capitalism. Audiences learn about the Ningbo entrepreneur's patriotic contribution to establishing China's first modern bank, stock exchange, insurance company, 
film production company, fashion school, and various industries, regardless of their political inclination, cultural identifications, and nationalities. And the evolutional chronology covers the whole 20th century. Two, the economic development of the past 40 years. The general observation that socialism has become less central to the official narrative of modern Chinese history is correct. So besides the state level association with the legacy of non-socialist history, such as the Asian Maritime Civil Row, a parallel emergence of cultural becoming in earlier history is also promoted to enact a unique China model, which leads to the national success of today. The Quanzhou Maritime Museum is one such example. The museum was created in 1959 and relocated in 1991 to present Quanzhou's long history as a major seaport of China, as well as a unique image as a cultural and religious melting pot. This history is known to the world through the 13th century travels of Marco Polo. The overviews of the museum's two main display subjects, Quanzhou religious sculpture and ancient Chinese sailboats models, are supported by substantial archaeological research and historical materials. And they hint at a multicultural background that connects the glorious history of Tang Dynasty, the Eurasian Empire of Ganhe Khan, with the contemporary openness of China. Representing, um, representing Asian changes from Persian and Arab. And all of, uh, we, can, we pick up scenes on the street that a commercial district packed with stores and shopping malls, also named after the Asian Maritime Sea Road. Compared with Ningbo and Quanzhou, Xiamen occupies a particular position at the unity front of the state. The Overseas Chinese Museum in Xiamen is founded in 1959 by a well-known leader of Overseas Chinese. While the museum is funded and supported by Chinese elites who have moved to foreign countries in the past few decades and benefited from China's economic growth and integration into globalization, the narratives and displays of the museum focus more on the suffering of lower class migrants, including the coolie laborers who have been transported and worked in poor conditions after the Opium War subjected to the U.S.-Chinese Exclusion Act in 1992 and the custody uh, of H Angel Island Immigration Station and the thousands of Chinese laborers and soldiers who served for the British, French, and the U.S. forces during the two world wars. So it is not surprising to encounter a juxtaposition of two contrasting images uh, at, the, at the entrance one of the suffering migrants and refugees who left the country because of war and poverty, the other of the uplifting overseas Chinese who returned to the country because of their strong sense of belonging and patriotism. But as history has revealed, we all know that the escalating of social and economic status is never that simple and straightforward. And the structural violence existing throughout colonial history and connecting people of color is still there. So while alternative historiographies and cartographies, relational narratives and subjectivities are usually marginal, marginalized in Sierra Museum, revival of the maritime zero in relation to urban gentrification, free trade and free port is promoted through reproductions of historical materials, archives, images, situations, and figurations to connect the long line of maritime history with the emerging middle-class audience. The curious confounding of speculation and histo histo historiography register the conundrum of state performativity and lies up negative spaces for artistic interrogation. The inherent hierarchy of museumology and historiography has been a continuous subject of artistic interrogation. The twelve-day trip of paracuratorial on the move shed light on complex interrelation between the local, the national, and the global, and the unbounded flow of things and the regulated bodies of migrants, laborers, the abstraction of the global free market, and the uneven distribution of freedom. 
So instead of leading to concrete conclusions, I'm going to wrap up today's presentation and leave room for further discussion in the Q&A section. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nikita, for this wonderful presentation. And I will uh, introduce our second speaker, Professor Brett Nielsen from Western Sydney University's Institute for Culture and Society. Professor Brett authored a number of works, including Border as Method and The Politics of Operations with Sandro Mazandra. In collaboration with Ned Rossiter, he has coordinated the research project Transit Level, Circuits, Regions, Borders, Logistical Worlds, Infrastructure, Software, Level, which will be the topic of his speech today, and Data Forms, Circuits, Labor, Territory. With Elias Marmaras and Anna Lascari, he is responsible for the conceptualization of the series game Carbonauts. As I mentioned earlier, Professor Brett will talk about his and his colleagues' project, Logistical Worlds, Infrastructure, Software, Labor, and he will enlighten us on the infrastructure and labor, the standards, protocols, and parameters, the algorithm and software involved in today's logistical world, on how circumstances can shift the dynamics of knowledge production, considering in particular the complexities of working across sites in three different continents and disciplines. Again, at the face of Belt and Road Initiative and COVID-19. I now welcome Professor Brett Nelson to the platform. Um, hi, my name is Brett Nielsen, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about a project called Logistical Worlds. This was a large research project which ran from 2013 to 2018 and investigated three shipping ports in which there was growing Chinese interest. The three ports were Reyes in Greece, uh, the port of Calcutta in India, and the port of Valparaiso in Chile. In each of these sites, uh, we composed research teams that consisted of academics, artists, and activists. And we also took care during the course of our project to move researchers across these sites in an attempt to create a common conceptual nomenclature with which to tackle the phenomena in which we were interested, which was primarily the interface between logistical processes and labor regimes. Now, uh, when this project began, the Belt and Road Initiative had not been announced. The initiative was announced in September 2013, uh, but that this announcement would be made was unknown to us as we were planning and conceiving the research. But indeed, the announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative really changed the course of this project because the project came to be understood as being about the initiative, and this brought us in contact with many kinds of people with whom we did not anticipate to be interfacing when we planned the research. Let me say something briefly about the sites. Uh, Piraeus uh, is very close to the city of Athens in Greece. Uh, it's the site of a large container shipping port. Uh, and the uh, Piraeus port uh, is commonly known as the Dragon's Head of the Belt and Road Initiative. It is undeniably uh, a central infrastructural installation in the Belt and Road. Uh, the Port of Calcutta, by contrast, uh, is one of the few places where Belt meets Road, uh, at least on this uh, particular map. One of the few sites within the initiative where you find a maritime route intersecting 
a land route. Uh, Calcutta, I will argue, is an unavoidable geopolitical choke point within the Belt and Road. The third site we examined, Valparaiso in Chile, is not on this map and is indeed not included in most of the graphic representations you will find of the Belt and Road. However, Chile has signed the Belt and Road Agreement with China and is undeniably part of the initiative. So I think this tells us two things. One, it says something about the flexibility and openness of the Belt and Road Scheme. On the other hand, it says something uh, about the narrowness of the representations with which we are familiar. I just want to mention that after the project was complete, I had the chance to organize another research team to visit the German city of Duisburg, uh, which is where the so-called uh, Yuchinau railway, railway arrives from Chongqing, uh, and where there is an important inland port on the Rhine River. Um, so I've had the chance to lead research teams working in four distinct Belt and Road sites. And I think this is quite significant because a lot is said about the Belt and Road Initiative uh, from a macro viewpoint. But I think if we really want to understand what is going on in this initiative, we need to look on the ground, we need to look at distinct sites and see what is happening. And the conclusion I think that we arrive from at, at from this kind of research process is in fact there are many different things happening and the Belt and Road is something different wherever it hits the ground. So uh, let me begin by saying something about Piraeus, which is again the dr often known as the Dragon's Head, undeniably an important site on the Belt and Road. Uh, what you see here is an image of Piraeus that ex as it existed in 2014, uh, which was the year we conducted fieldwork in this site. Uh, in the foreground of the image, you see uh, the terminal space leased by Costco Pacific, which is a company that lists on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange that is closely affiliated with the Chinese state enterprise Costco Group. Costco initiated their lease on this space in 2009 in the depths of a severe economic and political crisis in Greece. And uh, during the term of their lease, they have managed to increase massively the productivity of this port. Piraeus is now one of the fastest growing container ports in the world, uh, and it has become an important transshipment hub for boats, large boats arriving from China, which then uh, transfer their cargo onto feeder ships uh, that travel to smaller, smaller ports in the Mediterranean. Um, this involved considerable investment uh, in equipment, in hardware, such as the three blue post Panamax cranes that you see in the foreground of the image. These are cranes that are uh, capable of unloading ships that would, would be too large to fit through the Panama Canal before its recent expansion. Now, um, in the back of the image, you see where the orange cranes are arrayed, uh, the smaller portion of the port, which in 2014 uh, was still run by Piraeus Port Authority, uh, an organization which at the time was majority owned by the Greek government. Um, and uh, in 2016, uh, the uh, a Costco Group, or its, rather its subsidiary in Greece called Piraeus Container Terminals, took over also this part of the port, uh, as well as some other areas of the port, such as the ferry terminal, which you see in the bay uh, in the background of this image. The uh, arrangement you see here that is depicted here uh, is, I stress, the one that existed in 2014. Uh, this is a graphic arrangement of the way in which the port was organized uh, at the time. Uh, 
and it may not be the best way of uh, representing the space, uh, but then nonetheless, I think this uh, graphic is quite useful uh, for delineating the uh, uh, different spaces at hand. Uh, now, uh, in our research, we managed to enter into the part of the port run by the port authority. Uh, the trade unions working in that uh, part of the port were friendly to us. Uh, and we had uh, excellent access to this part of the port. Our uh, access to the part of the port run by Costco uh, was a much more difficult affair, but we did manage to talk to many of the workers uh, who were active in that side of the port. Um, and uh, we eventually made a, a video game called Cargonauts, uh, which is accessible on the project's website, which was based in this uh, part of the port. Uh, in any case, um, I want to say something about the, uh, the, the differences uh, in the logistical and labor regimes operating on the two sides of Piraeus Port in 2014. Uh, and this is a loaded discussion, because when we arrived in Greece, we found the dominant narrative about the Costco lease was one that can be summarized by the word Chinification. Because uh, the Costco interest had uh, entered in the depth of a severe economic crisis, uh, there was a story that existed, particularly on the Greek left, which said that this was the import of a Chinese labor regime into Europe. Uh, and uh, that this accompanied a kind of uh, a degradation of Greece in the hierarchy of nations. Um, our uh, research was quite opposed to this narrative. We did not buy this story at all. Uh, and uh, it has to be said that there's a lot of rhetorical sparks that fly around the presence of a Chinese state enterprise in this particular port. Because you have to understand that this port is a, something of a citadel of Western civilization. If you read Plato's famous book, The Republic, its first sentence is, I went down to the Piraeus yesterday, nestled in this space, putatively, are the foundations of Western metaphysics and politics. So the presence of a small Chinese-run uh, economic zone in this space is something that really makes a civilizational sparks fly. Now, in our research, we were able to enter through uh, this uh, smaller side of the port right up to this uh, particular border here. And I think it's worth to say that when you approach this space uh, physically, there is no line on the ground. Uh, this myth that over here you have Greece, over here you have Europe, over here you have China, over here you have Plato and the allegory of the cave, but over here you have the 10,000 things and the five relationships, I think is something that needs to be undone. And the way we tackle these questions in our research was to follow the software look at the logistical regimes at play in either side of the port. So briefly to say something about this, there were two different terminal systems running uh, on the different parts in the different terminals operating in threads. On the Costco side of the port, they ran a, a terminal operating system called Katos, it's a product made by a South Korean company called Total South Bank, uh, and it is run across many ports in Asia, particularly on China's eastern seaboard. On the uh, Greek side of the port, uh, they ran a, a widely diffused uh, terminal operating system called Navis Sparks. A particular version they ran was N4. Uh, Navis is a Silicon Valley product. It's the most widely disseminated terminal operating system in the world. Now, these systems, even though they can be patched to 
perform quite similar tasks uh, as they existed in Piraeus at the time of our research were working in, in uh, uh, different ways. Uh, CATOS was uh, enabled for what we call process mining. It's a data mining process which works from event logs of equipment moves. What this data mining process aimed to achieve was the minimization of idleness of expensive pieces of hardware, such as those blue post Panamax cranes that I showed you uh, earlier in the presentation. The labor that was called in and out of Piraeus port on a precarious basis was to smooth over periods of busyness. But the software installed did not aim to monitor real-time labor performance. Uh, in that sense, the logistical regime running here is very different from something like an Amazon warehouse. Uh, because what is at stake is the maximization of fixed capital, the maximization of the activity of those expensive pieces of hardware, uh, which uh, are much more central to the operation than labor. Uh, now, on the Greek side of the port, uh, you had unionized labor. The biggest difference between the two workforces was age. On the uh, Costco side of the port, you had Greek men aged 30 and 40 working on extremely precarious labor regimes. They tended to be more highly educated than those Greek men of ages 50 and 60 who were working on the Greek side of the port uh, with secure positions. Now, when uh, goods were passing over that putative borderline from one side of the port to another, even though these software systems can communicate through a protocol called, called electronic data interchange, uh, the mode of exchange was analog. There were workers standing there logging the movement of containers, one, two, three, four, strike, in, uh, on pen and paper. And I think that this movement uh, uh, from sophisticated computation uh, to analog modes of annotation is quite important when understanding uh, the interface between uh, logistics and labor regimes. This became very clear when we moved our research to Calcutta. Now, Calcutta, uh, as I mentioned, is an important choke point on the Belt and Road. It's an unavoidable port because it has such a wide hinterland, as you see in this diagram here. It's an international hinterland which encompasses Nepal and Bhutan, as well as uh, a large swathe of northern India and uh, the frontier land of northeast India. One of the areas we studied in our research is the so-called chicken's neck, uh, which connects the state of West Bengal to India's northeast to a narrow corridor of 26 kilometers, of, which is Indian territory, but is bound on the one hand by Nepal and on the other hand by Bangladesh. This is a territorial and geopolitical choke point. All goods coming from China uh, across the uh, land routes must pass through this choke point, as is all, all goods going into India's northeast uh, that come into the port of Calcutta. Significantly, uh, Bangladesh uh, represents a geopolitical obstacle because of the historical relations between India and Bangladesh. Routes between uh, China and Calcutta can not pass through its territory. And this is seen very uh, clearly in the so-called K2K initiative, Kunming to Calcutta. The route you see here is specifically designed to skirt uh, Bangladesh. Now, Calcutta port is a complex arrangement of facilities. It's a river and port, and it, it's, uh, there are many sand banks in the river, and it's very hard to negotiate the passage of uh, ships all the way up to uh, the city of Calcutta. So in the early 70s, a container and uh, uh, bulk port called Haldia uh, was, bought, was uh, uh, constructed at the uh, entrance to the river. And we conducted research here 
as well as in uh, the city of Calcutta itself, where the port divides into two, Kitapur and Netaji Subhas Dock. Uh, the Subhas Dock is a subsidiary of PSA, uh, the uh, Port of Singapore Authority. Um, and uh, almost every container that comes into this port uh, has passed through Singapore. So Singapore, in this case, is the important transshipment port, and Calcutta is the uh, peripheral port which receives the feeder ships, which have to be quite small if they're going to navigate their way all the way up the Hooghly uh, to reach this particular dock. Uh, now, when we were conducting research in uh, these sites, we conducted an exercise where we uh, uh, entered a cluttered uh, container park. This is a very crowded area. Trucks have to enter through extremely uh, narrow streets through which they can hardly fit. It's almost like the, you know, the big container ship that's now stuck in the Suez Canal, but on an everyday and banal basis. This is just normal activity in a choke point like Calcutta. In any case, we recorded the uh, numbers on these containers, and we used a track trace application on the internet uh, to track their journeys around the world for a year. What we found quite interestingly is we could not only see this movement in and out uh, through Singapore, and sometimes the uh, port of Hamburg Tolta, uh, which is another important uh, Chinese-run port in Sri Lanka, uh, but the fact that they tended to disappear uh, from these forms of digital tracking when they entered the Indian subcontinent. So this tells us something important about the relation between digital forms of logistical control and the logistical and labor regimes that exist on the ground in a place like Calcutta. Let me just give you a, a, an example of this uh, from our research in the Haldia part of the port. This is a image of a port manager who is assigning ships to worker, workers. And you can see that he's moving between a computer-generated manifest and some jotted hand notes. What he's doing in this process is actually quite a complicated political task because the major conflict in how the port is not between management and unions, but between unions, between uh, a left front affiliated union, uh, which uh, is uh, manned by the permanent workers, and between uh, uh, a union which is affiliated uh, with the current ruling party of uh, uh, West Bengal, the Trinamool Congress, a much more populist party, um, uh, with which the uh, casual workers have aligned themselves. Uh, so in this uh, process of negotiating uh, between these two uh, political forces that are loggerheads, uh, the manager is moving between the digital and the analog. It's that same movement we saw in the crossing of that border in Piraeus. And I think, again, this is quite significant to the way in which logistical and labor relations play themselves out on the ground. Have a look at this image, which is in the Kidapur part of the port in Calcutta. What's interesting about this is that we see teams of workers. These are uh, workers uh, who are bound to a, the so-called Sidari system, a headman system, whereby there is a, 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 a kind of boss man that negotiates their uh, work uh, with unions and, and uh, with the uh, port authorities. But the interesting thing about this is the, uh, these people are lifting uh, sacks loaded with lentils and chickpeas and these other kinds of dried edible goods. Uh, but they're being paid to move these commodities by weight. Now, this completely flouts the protocols of the so-called logistical revolution that unfolded in the uh, 60s and 70s, which involved the containerization of shipping and, and it, its modularization. Uh, 
essential to this modularization was a change of the unit of measure in shipping from weight to volume. It doesn't matter how heavy a container is. What matters is the space that it occupies and how that space is assigned within complex digital systems. Yet here we have, been, we have people being paid to move goods by weight. Again, this is an analog environment outside of the regimes of digital control. Yet this does not mean it is outside of regimes of control altogether. In fact, there are quite harsh regimes of control active in this space. We cannot read the, uh, the labor relations of the technologies. We cannot say, because there are shiny new technologies in Piraeus, the labor relations are more easy or more harsh than they are in Calcutta, because it is a ramshackle port in the middle of a geopolitical choke point. Now let me move on briefly uh, to the port of Chile. Uh, I don't have much time left, so I'm going to have to be necessarily brief. Uh, but Valparaiso, the port that you see pictured here, was a site that was expected to expand during the years in which we were conducting our research. This didn't happen for a number of complex reasons. Uh, one of them is which it's only one of a number of ports which serve the uh, Santiago metropolitan uh, region, and there was significant expansion in uh, some of those other ports. Now, uh, Valparaiso is a sister port to uh, Guangzhou, uh, and uh, the major commodity exchange between Chile and China uh, takes place around the good of copper. Uh, copper is Chile's number one export. Chile is the number one copper producing country in the world, and China is the number one copper importing country in the world. So the passage of copper uh, uh, between sites like Valparaiso uh, and China's uh, East Coast ports uh, is uh, a really important commodity flow uh, within contemporary global trade. Uh, now, this is the open pit mine of Andina, uh, run by the Chilean state mining company Codelco. Uh, it's the closest Codelco mine uh, to uh, Valparaiso. Uh, and we had uh, excellent access to the uh, facilities of uh, this company. Uh, we also uh, visited the Center for Mathematical Modeling at the University of Chile, where they're interest, interested in introducing new kinds of logistical efficiencies into the copper supply chain. So you have to understand that copper is uh, an element which is a tradable commodity on global financial futures markets. Its price is set through speculation on its uh, uh, future uh, price. So the uh, way in which the price of copper is set is quite abstracted from this dirty open pit environment. It's happening in places like uh, London, Chicago, and Shanghai, where you have important futures markets. It's not happening on the ground in Chile. So that with the, the pricing mechanism quite detached from the uh, scene of production, one of the only ways in which the uh, 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 Chilean uh, interests can react uh, to uh, the, you know, the supply and pricing issues is by trying to introduce logistical efficiencies. Now, all mine from this uh, site is milled and then transported by uh, train to a site called Ventana, which is about 90 kilometers north of uh, Valparaiso on the Chilean coast. 
And here it, the, the ore is smelted uh, in order to create a very pure copper product known as a cathode. This is the exportable product. It is a very pure copper, a very pure form of copper. It's not quite the pure element. It's about 99.9% .9 pure. Uh, but its uh, process of smelting is a ritual purification by which this ore is made ready for market and made ready for global logistical mobility, uh, which passes through ports such as uh, Valparaiso. Uh, now, interestingly, um, uh, to talk about the labor regimes associated uh, with this supply chain, uh, I'll show you an image from produced by some of our artist collaborators uh, working in the collective called Crack in Valparaiso. Uh, and this is an image about the forms of uh, toxicity to which workers in the smelter have been exposed. This area of Ventana is known as a sacrifice zone. It's a toxic zone. Uh, and many of the workers from the smelter have had the green from copper absorbed into their skin. They're known as Los Hombre Verdes, the, the green men. So one of the byproducts of this ritual purification that makes copper ready for logistical mobility and for financial trading is toxicity. Toxicity that enters the body of the people who work closely with it. There is much more to say about Valparaiso and particularly the interesting labor regime that operates in the port historically called La Nombrada, uh, which is a form of labor assignation uh, that changed massively under digitalization. Uh, but I'm approaching half an hour, so I'll stop here. And I just want to note uh, and return to that theme that I uh, discussed at the beginning of the presentation, which is the distinct differences in the way in which logistical and labor processes uh, hit the ground in different sites. If we're going to understand anything about this initiative, we have to work in and through these differences. To make grand pronouncements about geopolitics or, or debt or South-South uh, relations, uh, these are all very nice propositions. But until we understand what is happening in, on the ground, until we have a theoretical frame that can help us work through those differences in a careful way, all these pronouncements will be quite hasty. Let us have the patience to see how things evolve. And let us discuss this across the panels and the, the presentations uh, taking place in this particular curatorial exercise. So I thank you for listening. I thank uh, Biljana Zdenka and the others who have organized uh, this particular encounter. And I look forward to talking with you uh, in the question and answer session. OK, thank you very much, uh, Professor Brett. And our next speaker is Ash Moniz from Egypt, Cairo. Ash Moniz is a Cairo-based multidisciplinary artist whose practice spans performance, installation, video, and film. Uh, he uh, did his BA from OCAD University, Toronto, and he participated in independent study programs such as Raw Academy in Dakar, Senegal, the Harun Faroqi Institute in Berlin, Germany, and Mass Alexandria in Egypt. Montez's exhibitions include solo shows at Town's House Gallery in Cairo, Sisha Museum in Beijing, and HMFF in Nanjing, and group shows at Forum Expanded 
in Bali, Dakar Biennale in Dakar, and the Minshe Museum in Shanghai. Ash Moniz will talk to us about how the extraterritoriality of logistics carves out geographies of supply chain infrastructure and also how it molds the spatial considerations of logistics workers solidarity networks. Now I leave the floor to Ash. Hi, uh, my name is Ash and I'm an artist uh, based in Cairo, working between the realms of performance, installation, video, film, amongst other mediums. And yeah, first off, I'd like to say um, thank you to Biliana for organizing this and to Sinkne for moderating and that it's a pleasure to be on this panel with Nikita and Brett and I'm excited for the conversation afterwards. And yeah, so um, I'm just going to talk um, a little bit about my work. Um, I've just kind of joined the Maritime Portal Residency, a virtual residency organized through this program. Um, that is, I guess, a cell of the larger project. And um, so as I've just kind of joined on board, um, my presentation today will be just about a select a um, couple of works that have to do with um, uh, ports and kind of maritime infrastructure and the way that I'm kind of incorporating that into um, a certain strategic aesthetic and a concept of representational leverage. And so, yeah, um, I'm going to just get straight to it and just uh, start showing some examples of my work. And so the first um, work that I'm going to talk about is a film that I made in 2017 um, called In the Anticipation of a Future Need to Know. And this project um, was based on um, uh, about a year's worth of research in which I was kind of mapping the supply chain route of paper from the port of Tehela to the Mugama in Cairo, which is like the <clears throat> like administrative bureaucratic hub where um, it's kind of the architectural epitome of paperwork. Um, and so, yeah, the rather than focusing on the kind of documental logic of this transfer of paper from cargo to document. Um, this was to some extent also a project looking at the kind of performativity of logistical mapping as a form of implotment, um, looking at logistics itself as it's in terms of its relationship to plot. And on one hand, that's kind of looking at the etymological history of the word plot and its connection between land ownership, like a plot of land, and narrative structure, like a narrative plot, um, and a way of kind of expanding beyond certain um, cartographical modes of representation. And so here, this work is kind of based around a, a performance of plotting, um, a fictional scenario, a script, that is based on um, very specific research on supply chain um, infrastructure, policing, and the ways in which threat and lost time is prevented in the managerial mind of logistics. And so before showing, I'm just going to um, just briefly kind of contextualize that in relationship to how so much of logistics is um, or abides by a necessary kind of representational framework, one that is very much um, tied to the concept of mapping lost time, um, in the sense that obviously logistics and supply chains are like at their core temporally founded, obviously in the sense of it being just in time logistics um, and a, a very specific kind of like coding of, of time in which lost time is the enemy to some extent. And that is made very much clear in the current, I guess, no longer current as of a couple hours ago, or, oh yeah, yesterday, I'm pretending. Anyways, um, <laughs> um, 
of the situation in the Suez Canal. Um, and so anyways, yeah, I'm trying to think of this, these kind of ways in which cartographies of loss um, are performatively enacted. And so here I'll just show a clip from that. <laughs> بص يا ريس 3.1 من 10% من شحنات النقل الجوي هي ورق ده فرحتي ما هي نسبه برضه ضعيفه هي اه نسبه ضعيفه بس هي اه نسبه ضع... آه. ومن ناحيه ثانيه آه الاي تي اف اللي هو اتحاد عمال النقل الجوي شبكته في مصر قويه ومن خمس سنين قدر ينظم احتجاج ناجح في السخنه هنا ونجح يضغط على الشركات ومع معدلات نقل عاليه زي اللي احنا متوقعينها فاحنا احتمال كبير قوي يحصل لنا مشاكل مشابهه. وايه اللي جاب الارهاب؟ لعمال النقل حضرتك. اللي جابه ازاي؟ هو النقل ده نقل ايه؟ نقل بضايع. تمام والبضايع دي بتتنقل فين؟ مش في كل حته في انحاء الوطن؟ وبعدين مطابع الشرطه فيها البنزينات بتاعتها يدغف. فالتريلات بتاعتها مش هتحتاج يعني تقف تمون بنزين من المطبعه للمطبعه من غير ولا وقفه يدغف كده روح قولي كده الرامي كده فاضل ايه؟ ايه اللي فاضل؟ دي كمان داخله فيها لجنه بيتم اتخاذ القرارات التعاونيه من خلالها ما بين الوزارات العميل زي مصلحه الجوازات مثلا ومطبعه ومطبعه الداخليه نفسها حلو كده نراجع الخطه انا وحبيبه هنبقى بنظبط ورق الشحنه وائل أنا هستلم في مينا اسكندرية هنا وهتأكد مع التظبيط مع عمال الشحن بحيث إن ما يبقاش في مشاكل وهتأكد من تسليم الشحنة سليمة. حبيبة. وأنا هنا في الداخلة عشان عملية تبديل الشحنة. محمود. التخزين قبل النقل في برج العرب هنا والتظبيط مع الـ اي تي اي تي. وأنا هتولى التظبيط مع سلطات الطرق السريعة بحيث إن إحنا ننجز موضوع التعريفة ده. وأنا هتولى النقل الجوي. وأنا همسك الداتا. يبقى على بركة الله. And so, yeah, it's meant to be um, quasi absurd, um, but also in its like enacting, in the role of that enacting, it looks at kind of the, the labor of acting in relationship to the kind of performativity of object social relations um, within logistical infrastructure um, and the kind of um, archetypes and not only the archetypes of logistical media, but also the archetypical frameworks through which um, transport workers are um, framed through a certain type of subject formation in the sense that they are like the lifeblood of the nation relies on them to uphold the continuity of the flow of supply. Um, which on one hand is this like strangely paradoxical position between responsibility and threat in the sense that any workers organizing um, constitutes a threat to the very core of um, national security oftentimes. And there are oftentimes in which even um, dock workers going on strike can be constituted as terrorism or other um, modes of um, other realms of subjecthood that kind of stem outside of the nation. Um, and so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of my work in general kind of looks at these representational modes of kind of, um, yeah, the, way, the ways in which like criminalization and threat shape 
a kind of employment of supply. Um, and so um, in thinking about, um, yeah, the representability of interruption, um, one point that a lot of my work has kind of been um, guided or inspired by, um, and there's a work that I'm about to show or a sample of some research experiments um, that were based around this one phenomenon that um, took place in the port of Sokhna in Egypt um, in 2012-13. Um, while the uh, dock workers were on strike, they were um, fighting for bargaining rights and for hazard compensation and for um, the contractual terms of this kind of turnover that took place between Platinum Services, the previous terminal, oper terminal operating company, and DP World, the one that took its place. Um, and so in 2012 and 13, there were a whole bunch of different um, strikes and other modes of organizing at the port, and it had been shut down completely several times. And in the end, um, also guided by a lot of solidarity actions, um, there had won some significant victories in terms of um, the history of victories, but not necessarily in terms of what would be the best victories for the workers. Um, but anyway, so there's this, during that moment, there was a kind of um, media battlefield internally uh, between the workers and between the employment. Um, workers were uploading videos to the internal Facebook groups and YouTube, etc., of themselves demonstrating and um, with sit-ins and um, protesting with signs and um, trying to get their message out through uh, media that was directed specifically towards management. And then management was also responding in the form of video. And so it's interesting because while ports are some of the most kind of securitized locations on, in a nation, um, I've found an interesting access to this port through the kind of uh, media landscape that was took place through private messages um, and Facebook groups and kind of um, just like this online um, mode of publicness um, that really kind of took the port out of its somewhat geographical confines. And there was this one video in particular that I found very important um, in terms of its access to logistical literacy and representational leverage. And so there was this one video in which um, someone at the port was toured, like a worker at the container depot in Zochna was, was touring the space to the camera, holding the camera, walking around and um, pointing out the different um, stacks of containers. And so saying like, over here we have Evergreen, and over here we have Yangming, here we have Henjin, etc. And then he comes across one pile of containers that, um, as he says, is not supposed to be there, but was only there temporarily due to the worker strikes. And so I found this to be, um, representationally speaking, one of the most powerful um, ways of actually locating the evidence of human action, of the labor resistance um, within the inventory itself, within the containers. And that's something that's extremely important because of the fact that containers rely on their um, illiteracy and their inaccessibility and the fact that like almost every images of uh, every image of con containers that you'll see are easily interchangeable with every other image of containers. Um, and the supply chain benefits from that representational framework in the sense that um, it almost just becomes like one singular thing, as if it's all just like one representational entity of just the abstraction of these containers, which not only conceals what's inside the containers, but also conceals the actual social relations and the violence that is kind of guiding and plotting um, the, what's actually happening at the ports. And um, so seeing this, um, this, these pile of containers that were not supposed to be there, um, on one hand, yeah, it really, accesses a certain form of literacy to be able to read these containers um, and also looks at the evidence, the materiality of evidence within human action, um, within supply chains and how we can read um, 
port infrastructure as being artifacts of performativity, artifacts of action, um, not only in terms of the results of planning, in terms of the previous video that I just showed, um, but also in terms of um, labor resistance. Um, and so that's something where lost time is located on the opposite end. And that's also why I use the term representational leverage in the sense that it's like utilizing that loss and utilizing that fear of loss through that representational logic of trying to plot out lost time, but here locating it visually as leverage um, for the actual workers that are fighting for um, their rights. And so here, I'll just show a, a brief clip of, um, yeah, some research experiment I've done with them. <laughs> المنطقة الصينية بجوار مصنع السويدي للأسمنت مساحة المكان حوالي 11000 متر طوله 210 وعرض 55 متر And so that also leads into another expansion of that um, video, of that logic, and thinking about that literacy and those modes of representation, and thinking about um, logistical media and thinking about the materiality of evidence within inventories and infrastructure. Um, this next work that I'm going to show um, kind of interweaves these different things as a way of trying to think about um, what is a logistical image and what is, um, especially in terms of its overlapping, so I'm kind of overlapping these things that I just mentioned, and that overlappingness is something that's representationally important because of the fact that logistics and supply chains and ports rely on a certain kinds, kind of like ontological interconnectivity in the sense that their locality is automatically defined by that of others. Each port is exists in relationship to other ports and etc. Um, and so, um, yeah, and thinking about logistical media, not only in terms of like the media that is uh, presented publicly by logistics companies, um, but also the images produced by workers and the internal videos from management to workers, but then also the other different ways in which logistics itself operates through media and through um, representational logics in terms of these forms of mappings, in terms of container scanning, in terms of um, the, the kind of logic that I talked about, about the representation of containers. Um, and so, yeah, this work, um, I could say way too much about this work, but I'm going to try and cut it down to very specific points, which hopefully might uh, not reduce its ability to make sense, but either way. So it's kind of um, one of the core points is based around a um, fiction filmmaker uh, from Alexandria who was hired by the state to produce legal evidence for a shipping company to prove that cargo had arrived according to regulation. And so this video that he produced would be used in court um, to legally um, prove visually that um, a certain cargo, an electricity generator, had been unloaded from the ship um, according to the exact procedure. And so the German company that had sent this electricity generator to a uh, port of Rashid in Egypt um, wanted to like make sure that the workers were going to unload this thing the way that it needed to be done and uh, according to a very specific kind of procedure. And so, yeah, the recipient was... Uh, it, it, yeah, had to give evidence. And so the logic of this evidence is let's hire a, fil a fiction filmmaker to come with their camera and actually record this whole process. And so I worked with this filmmaker um, and we kind of reenacted 
the scenario, not only of the actual unloading and that whole process that was filmed, but the process of filming. What are the angles that he filmed from, et cetera. Um, and on one hand, um, it, in a, to some extent, is like uh, re reenacting or re-embodying this like form of emplotment, of kind of mapping uh, things in space, but also um, trying to also think about the kind of spectacularity of that infrastructural moment. I mean, infrastructural projects in general benefit so much from a certain kind of like spectacular aesthetic. Um, and especially this one, in the sense that this uh, electricity gener generator was so massive that they needed to build an eight kilometer road um, in order for it to drive, like the trucks that were carrying this generator needed to drive on a very specific road that they built only for that one moment, for that one uh, temporal process of unloading of this one arrival and not only building this road, also dredging the entire uh, area of the port, port region was kind of like outside the port uh, in order for this big ship to arrive. So anyways, kind of like disentangling that spectacularity and um, reenacting it within a set that I had built, which was a kind of um, a, a recreation of a crime scene from a um, commercial advertisement for a forensic camera in which uh, police were the ideal consumers. So trying to think about the kind of the role of criminalization within um, supply chains by thinking through the police, the directionality of, of supply in relation to the, the police being the consumers and how, what kind of cargo um, operates within that logic. So yeah, um, I'll just show a brief clip of that. And so it kind of looks at how this form of logistical media as evidence with another form of logistical media of evidence, um, different forms of crime in terms of interruption, the representability of lost time. Um, and that's kind of um, also like one of the actors in this film is um, his day job was other than acting, um, producing internal media for a logistics company for management to provide to their employees, to give them tasks and goals and to kind of like set the parameters and guidelines of what can be expected by management um, in, in, in the form of like cartoons and strange kind of abstract videos. And so he plays a role also as an actor, but then also interweaving with his own personal um, life, talking about his production of film while also in the film being an actor and also acting with that filmmaker who had produced uh, video evidence in court and also kind of entangling that crime scene in relationship to that uh, locating of evidence within the inventory in Sochna. Um, so anyways, I will not ramble on too much. Here's a clip from that. You might imagine uh, yourself wandering through the house, um, choosing as various loci, tables, um, a chair seen through a doorway, a windowsill. And when it is time to deliver um, the, spe uh, the speech, all you have to do is recall the different parts of the house in order. Um, the same training skills are used by uh, stage actors and uh, barristers at court. It does not get up and walk. What moves is the property title of the thing, not the thing itself. Out of 
So I have to record it in order to deliver it to the company, to use it as a proof of uh, quality, uh, like a proof of efficiency that they did the moving and receiving of these parts in a good shape or a bad shape. And um, so uh, in case any damage happen in the future, it would not be the responsibility of the logistics company. Ensure that there is an option uh, where you can transform um, any shape uh, into a lot of particles, um, as this is what we will be doing. But our largest waste of human effort which go on every day through such of our acts as our blundering, ill-directed, and which Roosevelt refers to as lack of national efficiency. I, I had very little knowledge of what things looked like on the back end or behind the scenes, basically, of, of this logistics company. I would, I would illustrate the, the implementation of the business plans was always purely metaphorical. Like metaphorically to communicate that things would be organized, that basically we just want to improve uh, delivery time by the first quarter of the year, for example. And I'd have to come up with a way of making that. It's because you're communicating it to the employees within the company, so they're already familiar with the terminology. Everybody this is addressing is already familiar or aware of it, and I'm the, I'm the outsider. Like this is not an ad for DHL or a video on DHL for the, to the general public. It's to people who work within the company. So. Yeah, so I'm trying very hard to keep an eye of time because I have a tendency to blabber and ramble on and on and on and on. Um, but yeah, and so some other um, projects that I have worked on since then have kind of been each one builds off of the logic of the next and kind of maintains what had been established in the previous one in terms of um, certain forms of evidence, certain ways of thinking about property, property relations as props um, in terms of performativity and employment, um, in terms of logistical media, in terms of evidence and constitutions of time and the representability of lost time. Um, these are kind of like threads that continue through my work and so in other works that I've done recently that also kind of unpacked a moment in which the um, one of the oldest, um, often known as the first um, uh, police unit uh, invented in 1798 was actually invented by a shipping company by the West India, India Committee um, in order to manage the workers and to transfer a, their traditional system of wage into uh, a, an hourly date wage. So trying to like, I don't know, look at the kind of history of the criminalization of um, transport labor, um, specifically in ports, ports as sites of um, threat to capital and threat to um, the nation and how there's a kind of like automatic interweaving between, yeah, threat and loss that guides logistics. And that's a general kind of um, guiding force of logistics from its very core, from the supply chains of slavery um, all the way until now, this idea of um, preventing fugitivity, of operating around a logic that is not only um, has loss prevention at its core, um, but is like built from that. Um, and um, a lot of like logistical um, strategies come after the preemption of loss. Um, and a, a lot of that loss to some extent is the workers or the bodies that are involved within supply chains and supply um, to demand or to revolt or to resist or to have power. And, and so just to kind of interrupt myself, um, so I don't get too carried away with timing. Um, yeah, for the Maritime Portal Residency, I'm mainly going to be working through this kind of archive that I've been building over the past um, six or seven years, which has included um, conducting field work in ports all around the world, such as in Singapore 
and Bursaid and Beirut and Tripoli and Athens and Istanbul and many ports in Egypt such as Sukhna and um, the Suez Canal and also it includes um, collaborating with many um, transport workers unions um, particularly in ports working with the video archives that they've collected of their own organizing over the years um, and also collaborating with different institutions um, from Human Rights at Sea to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea to um, the International Transport Workers Federation and um, collaboration with um, other academics and um, many others kind of working in the field. And so I've kind of created an archive and generally through research and artifacts that have kind of been created and I guess over the years having like built up so much, I'm going to kind of take a lot of these questions that I've been talking about today, um, particularly, particularly in terms of like the representational landscape of um, logistics and supply chains and ports and maritime labor um, to try and think through um, the research that I've built up and research that I will continue to be doing primarily in Egypt um, throughout the duration of the virtual residency. Um, so yeah, um, there were some other things that I was going to show, but I, um, as assumed, um, got a little bit carried away with time. Um, so either way, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure and um, I'm looking forward to any questions you may have and to be able to discuss this further. Thanks a lot. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nikita, Britt, and Ash for this uh, wonderful presentation, uh, especially for me from a landlocked country and the subject so uh, diverse and complex. Uh, the presentation was a bit uh, uh, inspiring, but at the same time uh, challenging. Uh, I hope many of our audiences over uh, all over the globe will relate more closely with your presentations and I hope they have a lot of questions for you. Um, and my, uh, this, uh, the presenters are like from different disciplines themselves. Uh, Nikita, curator, great academician and Aish artist. And this is very interesting. Uh, and not only in this presentation, but working together from these different uh, disciplines may have its own challenges and uh, opportunities. I would like you to just share with us what uh, were the practical challenges of working across this discipline or in a multidisciplinary uh, teams and what uh, the products of this collaboration may be. Uh, that is, if the products are shared, for example, if the artists, academicians, curators produce something together like papers and they publish them together, or are they produce, uh, producing their like research products or artistic products independently? Uh, so this is my first question, whether uh, what the practical challenges are working in a multidisciplinary teams in and in your contexts like portals and what the products of this collaboration might be should i respond mm. first um, um so yes as go ahead. a curator yeah, as a curator, I um, I mean, I think of the job of curating as, of course, mainly uh, mediating and what are the programs um, I have developed in Times Museum. I would say over the past 10 years, um, I think our role yeah, is mainly here. to bridge different disciplines. And I think the challenges here. lies in, I probably would say um, from within the context of China, 
I think scholars uh, from other disciplines, not from visual art or contemporary, art, are a lot less informed mm -hmm. about um, contemporary artists' language, especially the formal language. And um, and but from the other perspective, actually. Uh, younger generation of <laughs> artists are actually quite informed by different kind of critical discourse, such as post-colonial discourse, and also I would say imperialism. Uh, so um, I I think of this uh, the challenge lies in uh, bridging uh, I would say scholarly research, which are usually presented. I was saying we, we are tax, textual form or in forms of articles with artistic language and also what we prop in an exhibition, a temple spatial framework of the exhibition, what I think of as in body language. So it's translation. Um, also the translation, I mean, not just between different disciplines, but translation uh, between different languages and different rhetoric. Um, mm -hmm. So it's probably what I can share. Um, I can also say something about the process of uh, organizing these projects, um, which has been curatorial to some extent, curating research with uh, academicians, activists, and uh, artists. And I think one of the distinct challenges here uh, in uh, conducting projects around logistics and labor is that um, the, um, you know, these processes are not only confined to courts, but they're affecting the research process uh, and the context in which people like academics and artists themselves work. So the, uh, the clearest example of this is just, uh, you know, a lot of our research is in precarity or in court settings, uh, but the people that we're working with, the various sites are coming on to our funders in a various way. So precarity is not only an object of our research, it also enables it. Uh, and this sets up a, a kind of dynamic of conflict within the team often where uh, people come and say, well, uh, look, this research is critical of precarity, but it's also uh, perpetuating it in its, in its process. Uh, so uh, I think that really needs to uh, be uh, thought through. I feel like I'm, I'm just breaking up so much that you probably can't understand me because of connection problems. Uh, but briefly, uh, there are problems uh, bringing the material together across different categories of researchers and different sites. Uh, one way in which we've tried to do that is through small uh, designed publication projects and trying to use language of graphic design uh, to give a, 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 an identity and appearance uh, to uh, diverse research processes. Yeah, I would I say that my, yes, yes, yes. yes, yeah, um, I guess my answer to that, would, um, okay, I guess there's a delay. Um, my answer to that in terms of the problems that arise, I guess, have to do with um, different forms of representation in terms of um, relation to truth or relation to um, facts or relation to like document or documentary forms. So for example, like, in a lot of the research that I've conducted, I've like conducted hours of interviews with um, workers who provide testimonies, um, but I'm not necessarily interested in sharing those testimonies in the form of art. Maybe I would like find other modes of sharing those testimonies, but also in discussing them with them, ways of representation that they associate with, they're also not necessarily interested in that as an art form and forms in terms of like the documentary. Um, but then in 
like my own personal artistic ambitions of moving away from the documentary. Um, it also then hinders on a kind of um, precarity in terms of accessibility, um, but also there's like a negotiation between the providing of information or the utilizing of representation as a form and how that kind of plays out. Um, and so I think that, yeah, working between um, art and um, academics and different people from different fields, everyone has their own kind of language and the disjuncture between these languages is something that is interesting. So I guess maybe the problem isn't necessarily a problem in the sense of it of it being problematic, but in it being something that like a challenge or something that has significance in that kind of disjuncture, these like fissures between um, ways of communicating and ways of um, accessing um, ways of modes of representation. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I am not getting questions from uh, the audience, so maybe I will use uh, this opportunity just to add one more question, uh, particularly for Nikita, for example, representing this uh, um, maritime silk road mm -hmm. in state uh, mm -hmm. museums is uh, uh, what I understood is uh, it's a, a particular form of narrative or representation. And my interest, uh, my question is, how do alternative narratives find their expression, and how does the mainstream narrative, that is, official narrative, respond to these uh, uh, alternative narratives? Um, I will say, um, state-run museums in China, the situation it's uh, completely. Between, uh, we are privately funded, and also most contemporary museums in China are private museums. And then there is the state-run museum system, which is, I would say, almost 100% separated, because uh, we intended to, uh, originally, like two, three years ago, I wanted to loan um, some artworks and also archives from a state-run museum about a female artist. And then it was not possible. So there is no circulation um, between these two systems. Um, the other thing is also there are any uh, museum um, that are able to have a permanent display of maybe art history from modern to contemporary uh, periods. And so um, the state-run museum actually welcome a lot bigger visitor number annually because it's funded, it had a lot of uh, funding from the state and private museum runs a completely different program, which we always try to address uh, certain social issues but with the um, with uh, together with uh, certain representation by artists and also artistic languages so there is a gap a huge gap in between um yeah there's two forms of uh presentation and so this i we i we embark on the trip to for me is uh personally i want to understand what um, might be a more mainstream narrative about globalization, especially a uh, kind of top-down image that is oh. represented by the state uh, museum. And of course, from uh, most of the artists we work with, it's a very, uh, it's a kind of manifold of globalization, I think, a very different kind of processes and different from more or less uh, uh, the perspective of global history and the history that with um, a kind of relational thinking um, and sometimes uh, also um, embeds with I would say ambiguous critique of what might be um, a more mainstream idea driven by nationalism, but 
Um, so if we are addressing to a similar group of urban or emergent urban public, so we have to know what they are, what might be more visible uh, in terms of um, yeah, story and, and narrative. So the whole, I think that's, I explain more like why did we do that? Um, I don't know whether I answer your question, Sinka. Okay, thank you very much, our speakers once again, and our uh, participants all around the globe for this wonderful discussion and lovely day. I hope this discussion will open up for all of us to further our uh, interactions in academics or arts. Thank you again and good night or good day for me. Thank you, Sinkne, very much. Thank you, Ash, Nikita, and Brett for the great discussion and the presentations. See you all tomorrow for the last day of our symposium where we will all sit together and discuss our modes of working. Thank you very much and stay safe.